Module 4, Gender, Caste and Denotified Tribes, Subaltern Perspectives. In this module, we will look at three major undercurrents in India, gender, caste and denotified communities and the role of the subaltern perspective in the study of these systems. Need for women's history. In general, the history of humanity has frequently covered the history of men, their wars, their dynasties, their thoughts and their economic activities. Half of humanity has been left out in these historical studies. Ignoring women in history leads to distortions and failure in understanding the process of change and the values of society. This leads to a biased socialization process where biased sex roles are projected to the youth. History at every stage is a matter of selection of facts interpreted by each society in consonance with its values and beliefs. At this selection stage of history making, significance is attached to various facts, events and persons. And these women have been shortchanged. The history textbooks normally contain a chapter or two on social history in which the position of women is described. Most of the textbooks are androcentric in nature. The position of women is described, they are generally depicted as shadows of men and a few prominent women may be mentioned. Women as a group and their role in economic, political and social life of any period are not generally considered as a part of the historical process. Humanity's progress has been built by both men and women. Women have been sharing the work of nation building with men. Hence, one should challenge the one-sided anthrocentric history and change its pattern to include the so far invisible, ignored 50% of the population. History should record the experiences of the unnoticed 50% of women. Considerable work has been done in the field of placing women in a correct perspective in the histories of social and economic times and the studies of women. They are, however, not yet an integral part of the what could be called traditional historical writings, but could be utilized to build up a new comprehensive history in which women are given their rightful place. Some positive steps are necessary if historical writings are to really take cognizance of women as equal partners in the development of humanity. Origin and Evolution of Women's History In the 1960s, the origins of women's history took place when the feminist activists called for a history that would provide heroines, proof of women's agency, and explanations of oppression and inspiration for action. Academic feminists have responded to the call for her story by directing their scholarship to a larger political agenda where there was a direct connection between politics and scholarship in the early days. Later in the 1970s, women's history moved away from politics. It enlarged its field of questions by documenting all aspects of the lives of women in the past and so acquired a momentum of its own. Finally, the turn to gender in the 1980s was a definitive break with politics and so enabled this field to come into its own. Gender is a seemingly neutral term devoid of immediate ideological purpose. In this rendition, an evolution from feminism to women to gender, that is, from politics to specialized history to analysis took place. Many of those who use the term gender, in fact, call themselves feminist historians. It is a theoretical perspective that leads them to see gender as a better way of conceptualizing politics. Many of those writing women's history consider themselves involved in a highly political effort to challenge prevailing authority in the profession and the university and to change the way history is written. Much of current women's history, though it worked with concepts of gender, addresses itself to the contemporary concerns 
of feminist politics like welfare, child care and abortion rights as in the case of the United States. There is a reason to argue that developments in women's history are strongly related to the growing strength and legitimacy of feminism as a political movement, as there is to insist that there has been increasing distance between academic work and politics. Virginia Woolf in 1929 expressed the inadequacies of existing history, a history that needs rewriting. Women are both added to history and they occasion its rewriting. They provide something extra and are necessary for completion and they are superfluous and indispensable. Most women's history tried somehow to include women as objects of study. It assumed the view that the universal subject includes women and provided evidence and interpretations about women's varied actions and experiences in the past. The idea of accumulating information about women in the past would inevitably lead to their integration into standard history. This was encouraged in subaltern history as the emergence of social history with its focus on the collective identities of a wide range of social groups. The approach of social history strengthened the need and claim for the study of women. This resulted in considering women as a fixed social category, a separate entity and now as a known phenomenon that is as the biologically female persons who were in and out of different contexts, roles and experiences but whose essential being as women did not. As a result, the category women came into existence as a social entity besides its historical conceptual relationship with the category of men. On the whole, it dealt with more on the distinctiveness of women's culture. This led to the approach to search for evidence that women had the ability to make history. The usual traditional methods of academic discipline of history and sociology are often found to be inadequate to obtain the kind of information on women. A comparative subaltern study is the best method suited to study women's history. It certainly helps to pull everyone from our own stereotyped conceptualizations, biased observations, provides a new perspective, restores our sensitivity and gives fresh insights into what otherwise is an over-familiar phenomenon. The other important approaches and methods of sources of information on women are from the study of folklore and oral history. Folklore is lore of the people and it consists of myths, legends, folk tales, riddles and proverbs which reflect the lives of the people. It has a rich fund of information about the people, their beliefs, customs, practices and norms. However, caution is needed in identification of the time period and in the interpretation of symbols. The methodological issues involved in integrating women's history into mainstream history called for reconceptualizations. As a result, gender was the term used to theorize the issue of sexual differences. In the United States, the term gender was borrowed both from the grammar and the implications of man-made conventions or rules of linguistic usage. Sociology views gender as the roles assigned to women and men. The feminists adopt the subaltern and social connotations of gender, but not the biological connotations of sex. The relation aspects of gender is stressed, wherein women are conceived of except as they were defined in relation to men. Gender is defined as relative to social and cultural contexts. It encompasses the different gender systems and the relations of those to other categories such as race or class, ethnicity and also the aspect of change. The Dalits as subaltern, B.R. Ambedkar. B.R. Ambedkar was one of the most dominant political thinkers of India who critically looked at the caste system in India and its rigidity. 
He took up the issues of Dalits and Adivasi subalterns. He studied the impact of caste system upon the lower caste people and was best analyzed by him. Though during the early part of the Indian national movement, these issues were not taken into consideration, being born in a lower caste family, Ambedkar devoted his entire life to fight against the caste system which discriminated and marginalized the Dalit subalterns. After being educated in a foreign country, he came back to India and started practicing law. In 1920, he formed the Batishkrit Hitakarni Sabha in Bombay to promote the Dalits' interests and to resolve their problems by placing them before the government. He was not only critical of the caste system, but was also instrumental in the movement for eradication of caste-based discrimination. He also helped the Dalits to claim equal status and equal opportunities with other castes. Major writings of Ambedkar are The Untouchables, Who Are They? Who Were Shudra? States and Minorities? Emancipation of the Untouchables? Annihilation of Caste? The subaltern group of Dalits is one of the most oppressed and discriminated group of people in Indian society. According to Ambedkar, the subaltern communities are those which are discriminated by the dominant castes. In general, the lower caste people are referred to as Dalits as per the Varna system of Hindu society. But in the common political understanding and discourse, the scheduled caste people are designated as the Dalits. The term scheduled caste was first used by the British colonial government through the Government of India Act 1935. Gandhiji called them Harijans, meaning children of God. The Dalits are sometimes referred to by such news as exterior castes, outcast, depressed classes, scheduled caste, Harijans, ex-untouchables, etc. Ambedkar defines Dalithood as a kind of life condition that characterizes the exploitation, suppression and marginalization of Dalit people by the social, economic, cultural and political domination of the upper caste's Brahmanical ideology. They belong to the lowest strata group in the caste ladder of the Varna scheme of Hindu society, mostly referred to as untouchables. Ambedkar was critical of the idea of caste and its related attributes like occupation and hierarchy. He did not consider caste as a natural division, but rather a category of social discrimination. He holds the view that the Dalits are the most downtrodden people in Indian society, where they are socially, politically and economically backward. They were considered as polluted sections of the society, where their touch and even their shadow might pollute the upper castes. One of the important concepts introduced by Ambedkar related to the caste system was the idea of graded inequality. He differentiates between inequality and graded inequality. Inequality can be seen in various forms like skin color, racial and occupational or work differences. The black and white color differences are common in western societies. These are known as racial differences. The social division due to racial differences is the basis of prejudices, dissension, oppression being done against the race considered to be relatively superior. Similarly, in industrial societies, differences are based on different work positions. These are working classes, the proletariat, and the dominant classes, the bourgeois. Their socio-economic conditions and interests are different from each other. They are unequal classes and the conflicting relationship between them is perpetual. At the administrative and professional levels of the industrial societies too, there are subordinates, administrative and professional elites and bureaucrats, and subordinates, those who work under the superordinates. They are also unequal classes where inequality amongst them is based on the nature of productive work in which they are engaged in. Such inequalities based on skin color, race and occupation or work differences are various forms of inequalities. But graded inequality is a unique form of inequality which characterizes especially Indian society in terms of Hindu social order where 
the ascribed status of caste is the basis of differences and inequality. The Hindu caste system is a graded hierarchical system into four varnas vis-a-vis -vis the Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. The untouchables are outside the caste system. They are the people who are graded lowest in the caste system. They are not only different from others but also unequal by birth and accordingly their social and economic status is determined. According to Ambedkar, the caste system in India is a unique form of graded inequality where except Shudras and untouchables, the rest enjoy privileges according to their hierarchical social structure. The Brahmins at the top of the ascribed caste hierarchy enjoy the absolute benefits of the caste ideology. Their social and ritual status is the highest, but the Shudras and untouchables are the absolute sufferers in the caste hierarchy. Thus, in the caste system, people are divided and arranged in hierarchical orders. This is termed by Ambedkar as the graded inequality. To him, inequality is a social condition where the social status is given, it is predetermined and achieved by birth into that caste, cannot be changed except by non-ascribed achievement-based changes. Such a graded system leaves little or no scope or option for change in the ascribed status. They have no option but to fight the oppressive reality of the caste system. Although changes are taking place, the structural change, change in the caste status cannot take place unless the caste system is abolished and there is a casteless society. Denotified communities in India. During pre-British times, the history of the denotified criminal tribes show that their ancestors were either forest inhabitants or wandering tribes who had distinct cultural identities. Their way of life was relatively self-sustaining and the major centers of ancient Indian civilization had very little impact on them. This scenario changed with the advent of the East India Company. More and more forests were brought under the control of the British for commercial exploitation. With their lives thus threatened, many from these communities took to rebellions against the foreigners. More specifically, the denotified criminal tribes are those groups who were notified or classified by the British colonial government as born criminals in a series of acts and regulations leading to the Criminal Tribes Act 1871. The British colonial administration viewed their itinerant and nomadic lifestyle with deep suspicion especially after the Indian mutiny in 1857, when the British Raj equated their lifestyle to that of wandering criminals and antithetic to a modern civilized existence. They viewed criminality through the lens of the pervasive caste system in India and thus interpreted crime as caste-based or as an inheritable occupation. This was not new to the British, especially in the context of the gypsy population in England being looked at in similar ways. It is also pertinent to note that this prejudicial view of criminality by birth in India goes much before the British to the Hindu Vedic society with the Brahmanical propagation of the caste system and also corresponds with the aryan Dravidian divide where all nomadic communities and Adivasi groups were also considered Dravidian. Under the British rule, the Criminal Tribes Act CTA came into force on October 12, 1871 in India. Under the Act, certain Indian communities considered to be prone to the systematic commission of non-bailable offences such as thefts were systematically registered by the government. Since they were described as habitually criminal, restrictions on their movement were also imposed and adult male members of such groups were forced to report weekly to the local police station with the objective of establishing greater control over rebel rural regions and nomadic groups resisting the British Indian authorities. The Criminal Tribes Act ostensibly labelled around 200 tribal groups as born criminals. The provisions of the Act were extremely oppressive and discriminatory. Thus. Criminality in British India 
was seen not only as an individual act but also as a community or caste based phenomena. Eventually, the act was repealed in the Madras Presidency in 1948 and former criminal tribes were denotified in 1952. But the act was replaced with the Habitual Offenders Act of 1952. According to the Habitual Offenders Act, a habitual offender is one who has been a victim of subjective and objective influences and has manifested a set practice in crime and also presents a danger to the society in which he or she lives. The discretionary nature of the laws means that they can still be applied unevenly and this is viewed by many as a revised version of the Criminal Tribes Act. One example of such a denotified community is the Kalotar, a denotified criminal tribe which is still feeling the impact of the Criminal Tribes Act 1871. They are located in various parts of Tamil Nadu. This community has been subject to the stigma attached to the label denotified criminal tribes. Based on etymological evidence and also based on accounts by ethnographers Thurston and Singh, it can be stated that Odders refer to people who came from Orissa. According to Winslow, Odalar refers to a forgotten community, guild or caste that undertook the digging of wells, tanks, rivers, canals, ditches, etc. Odalar were professionals in hydraulics. They were hired to dig wells, tanks, canals and to construct earthen and stone buns or dams. There were two categories of order. Those who were specialized in earthworks were called man order and the stone workers were kal order. Today, the community lives in small settlements found in several districts in South Tamil Nadu. They live lives of poverty and are targeted as criminal by the law enforcement even today. They have been placed on the margins of society and have access only to the most minimal social resources. With continued prejudice and stigma, the flow of resources has been hindered. As you can see, the written records of the community are written from an elitist perspective and lack the subaltern idea. Only recently, with the advent of several research studies, the subaltern perspective has been employed in the understanding of the issues of these communities. De Souza states that the vicious cycle is strongly explanative of the precarious relationship shared by the police and the denotified tribes. He says, the way we view denotified tribes drives police behavior towards denotified tribes. In turn, that behavior molds our view of them. So, as we have seen so far, the subaltern perspective is always a democratic perspective, a people's perspective and promotes a deeper understanding of social realities. Thank you.